in North America and South America, the most successful communities based off the grassroots perception and definition of success are often five out of five in terms of encompassing these pillars and their daily livelihood. So basically, when we're looking at current projects, are we meeting these five areas? Is the goal of our project to promote not only the political, economic, environmental, and social, re improve those realities, is it, also gonna, is it also going to promote the spiritual well-being of the community? And also, flipping the script on this model, what paradigms am I operating in? Am I only thinking about the economic and political? Is that my framework? Because if I am, then that's only two out of five areas in terms I need to be addressed in terms of the community dynamics. Am I only thinking about the environmental, the land and water, not taking into consideration the political perspective of the community? Because if I'm only thinking about the environmental, then that's one out of five. Right? An example of this is education. And I present this to teachers a lot. I ask myself, where do I want to spend the next 10 years of my life? Do I want to be an educator? Do I want to do frontline community work with, with young children? And I do. However, I want to do so where they're critical of the university system and they know how to navigate that. Because as an educator in university, I see a lot of First Nations children come into university and not make it through the door. They, they drop out, they get RTD, right? they get caught up in toxic behaviors, and they don't come back. So for me to be a teacher in First Nations communities and only concentrate on the social element of high school and elementary and then send them off to university and them not having the skills to succeed, I would only be concentrating on one out of five. If I was only going to concentrate on education and not include in my elementary and high school courses the indigenous nationhood, the indigenous political perspective, then I'm just going to send my children out the door to become Canadians. I'm going to send them out the door to be colonized by the political system. Right? So these five pillars are very key in terms of not only helping us address our own paradigms, but also address the paradigms of the project that we're hoping to conduct. Casting that wide net is super important. So, <coughs> including all key areas of importance in any project or any goal for the indigenous community has to be taken into account. Right, the economic perspective, the political perspective, the environmental perspective, the social and cosmological perspective right, is going to determine the success of the projects that we're trying to conduct in First Nations communities. So, <coughs> solutions. Right? We need more dynamic teams. Right? One of the cool projects I worked on was the Nippy Network project where we teamed up with social sciences and um, hard sciences and engineers and actually went and conducted workshops in James Smith Cree Nation. And it was really cool in that the students were getting a really dynamic view of water infrastructure, not only from the hard science perspective, but the social science perspective also, the cultural perspective from the indigenous study side of things, and also the community dynamic of, of why we have these research teams coming in to begin with. Right, so being able to address the needs of the community is super important and having more dynamic teams with interdisciplinary approaches and methods is super important for any project. Casting that wide net and taking it into account those five pillars will determine the success of any indigenous, will determine the success of a project and the relationship it has with an indigenous community. Assess those overall fields of oppression like I talked about before. Right? Don't shoot yourself in the foot. Sometimes we go in with such a narrow paradigm that we, begin, we sometimes forget that it may have social ramifications, that it may have economic ramifications or political ramifications. The other option and the solution that I'm starting to realize is super important in, in my frontline work is that we need tabletop approaches. We need to be willing to talk to community members. We need to be willing to literally sit at the table and be able to explain and break it down what we're doing in those communities and how we're doing it. Right? Tabletop approaches, our, our living room approach. Being able to communicate and explain the work that's happening in those communities is super important. It's more manageable for families and households. 
Expecting the unexpected when we're dealing with wicked problems and, and trying to address the issues in the community, we need to be prepared to tolerate uncertainty and keep, keep in mind and maintain the long-term focus of, of, of our, our projects and ideas. And we need projects and ideas. That's the thing is we need on-the-ground projects in communities. We need to be out there and addressing the community needs on the ground. We need to see those attempts. We need to be able to see those attempts and, and see even if they create some more space. Right? That's one of the big things that, that we have. <laughs> this mic keeps dying out. Um, that's one of the things we need to see are these, these community projects taking place on the ground and in grassroots communities. So, what do we do now, right? For me personally, what do I do now? So one of the goals that, in terms of addressing um, the needs that we need in our communities, we need to reorient to kinship and cooperation, right? For non-natives, right, the treaty relationship is super important. Keeping in mind the territories, keeping in mind the peace and diplomacy narratives that exist for a lot of indigenous communities, keeping in mind the land-based practices, the land and water relationships, and this notion of, of colonialism still being playing out has to be kept in mind always. <laughs> Strive to relearn and reapply indigenous livelihood and practices. Right? Striving to relearn indigenous livelihood and practices doesn't necessarily mean living in a tiki again. Right? Sometimes it means revisiting, like number one says, our kinship to one another. Sometimes it means revisiting those treaty relationships in terms of the core understanding and teachings that were encompassed in the indigenous perspectives of treaty. Right? Prepare. Right? When I talked about pending water crisis in, in the Saskatchewan River Water Basin, we have stories in our communities that tell us of what's coming down the pipeline. Right? Learning those stories is important. Learning to survive. Learning to those vital connections to our traditional laws and our traditional practices is super important. The traditional knowledge. Observe. Pay attention to policy and policy makers. Right? One of the things that I'm noticing happening is there's a lot of strive to develop policy. And that's great. That's important. However, we need to keep in mind how that interferes or promotes indigenous nationhood, indigenous land-based practices and indigenous relationships to water. Right? Respecting indigenous lands and waters, respecting indigenous nationhood, that's super important stuff. Specifically because, like I said before, a lot of communities are viewing the land as theirs. A lot of communities still have long-standing ties to landscape and water. So there's decisions being made without consultation. There's assumptions being made without consultation. And it's interfering with a lot of the on-the-ground thought processes of indigenous people in very real, tangible ways. Expecting the unexpected. Being prepared to tolerate uncertainty. I would like, again, to emphasize how I admire people who are doing community work. Academics or researchers who are taking the time to do frontline community work and, and do work in indigenous, in indigenous communities. Because it is very uncertain, it is very unsettling in some cases. However, that's where the work needs to happen. This relationship of, of um, hard science and indigenous communities needs to be maintained and practiced. And again, sometimes some projects may not work. Sometimes some solutions may not work. But however, going in and doing, those, doing the work that needs to happen and, and looking at the outcomes long term is definitely important. So keep in mind the unexpected. So I wanted to sort of close off by giving you some of the communities perception, or giving you images of some of the communities I've worked in in the past few years. Not only did I work in First Nations communities in Saskatchewan and in Canada, but also communities in, in Belize, uh, Quechua Maya, Indigenous peoples. Defending and reclaiming tradition is basically um, the premise and the foundation of their relationship, not only with water, but their land-based practices in general. And this is the kitchen Maya in Belize. Um, I was trying to find a picture of my friend uh, who's from here. He has, he's actually behind the camera. 
Um, I went down there about three years ago and stayed in the in Toledo for about two weeks. And my friend uh, Pablo actually just came up a few weeks ago and came moose hunting with us. And we got two moose. And very similar perspective and very similar relationship in terms of him visiting our lands. What's your relationship to water? What's your relationship to to the lands and, and your land-based practices and things like that? And this is their lands, the Guna village in, in Toledo, Belize. Zapatistas had the opportunity to spend a week in Zapatista villages in Chiapas. And again, when I'm looking at those five pillars, these two communities, the Quechua Maya in Belize and the Zapatistas, have very clear political agendas, very clear political indigenous nationhood agendas, very clear economic agendas. What type of economic practices do we want to maintain? Very, very clear environmental relationships to their landscape, to their farming practices. Very clear cultural aspects and spiritual relationships to their land and the social structures that exist there. Five out of five on that, those five pillars I showed you. Very successful at maintaining that and raising their children to, to live and embody. So again, revisiting the goals. Ideally, I wanted to get across to you um, the goal to understand the overall landscape, the Saskatchewan River water basin, and is what, what is meant by ending water crisis. So again, looking at how we know through our indigenous cosmology, we know through indigenous data, our Western practices of collecting data, that there's some rough forecasts ahead. And how are we going to get through that? How are our projects preparing and helping indigenous communities prepare for those changes coming? Understanding the dynamics impacting indigenous communities, and again, colonialism. There is still a colonial agenda at play. And one of the things that needs to be acknowledged is it's not necessarily that indigenous peoples mistrust non-natives. It's that we're seeing the system still play out and yield the same results as they always have. Further loss of land. Further loss of culture, further loss of traditional ways of life. And despite us doing the best efforts to reclaim that, still being corralled and still being limited in our liberty to do so. The goal to, under the goal to understand multiple pers perspectives and multiple approaches and new ways of striving for solutions. So again, keeping in mind those five pillars, the cultural, the economic, the environmental, the social, and the spiritual. Are those needs being met in a lot of the projects we're trying to do? Right? Are those physical infrastructure problems economically viable for the community to begin with? Do they adhere to the cultural practices the community has to water? So again, ideally, those are the goals I tried to meet. So all my sources, again, Howard Meter, Global Institute for Water Security, and Patricia Grober, um, Adrian Tanner, who uh, did some work on looking at the impacts of colonialism in um, communities in Northern Ontario, uh, France Fanon, Tucker Yang, um, decolonial authors and, and theorists, and Brian Head's work, uh, Wicked Problems, and Identifying Wicked Problems in Water Policy. Um, and there's my contact information. So again, a lot of information compacted into 45 minutes, but again, hopefully opening you up, your hearts and minds to the indigenous truths and the realities of what's taking place on the prairie landscape in context to indigenous people and giving you the perspectives you need to ultimately achieve the goals you want to achieve. achieve. Thank you. Are we doing questions? Yeah. Yeah. I've got the mic here if folks would like to ask some questions. At least one. Yes. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Maria. I come from Ecuador and I'm doing here my PhD in the program of environment and sustainability. And also, I'm um, focusing my uh, research around water governance within the indigenous uh, perspective and worldview. 
Um, I've been familiar with um, the approach of decolonization, but I've been thinking lately and how um, First Nations or indigenous people can actually uh, improve or encourage to decolonize the, um, the, the traditional or the Western or the um, mainstream agendas in, in terms of um, policy. Because I think that um, many of um, First Nations people or indigenous people, even in my country, they are aware of all these uh, important points. But for my opinion, the big um, challenge is actually to reach the mainstream in, in terms of decision making and how you can um, actually decolonize them, their thinking, and be, so that they can acknowledge all the the rights and the, the that the First Nations deserve to get. Awesome. Yeah, that's a really good question. And, and thanks for asking that because in all reality, that's a question that in the Indigenous Studies Department we're, we're still trying to find the best answer to. You. So literally, lecturing Indigenous Studies 107, we have a majority of non-native students come into our, our class every semester. 300, roughly 300 students, and I would say 95% of those students are non-native. And it's an Indigenous Studies 107 class. Some of them are required to take it. Some of them take it out of interest. But the majority of those students can't name the indigenous territory they're in. They never heard of the term treaty, right? A lot of them heard about residential school only because it was in the media in the past few years with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. But a lot of them necessarily don't know who they are and where they come from in terms of the relationship they have with indigenous people. Right? When we're looking at rural Saskatchewan, we know that there's groups of indigenous people who are limited to certain areas. For example, southern Saskatchewan, southwestern Saskatchewan, there's not much indigenous communities down there because we were moved up through the process of colonization. So naturally those students coming from that territory have a long, hard time hearing the indigenous truths that are, are basically the reality of the landscape they've been living on. Um, but the goal to help um, non-natives decolonize and begin to speak about it. Again, for us, indigenous people in this territory, and I can only speak to Treaty 6 territory because that's where I grew up in, um, we do have a treaty here. We do have a treaty welcoming non-natives into this territory. Right? We do have a treaty where we wanted to share these lands and these resources with them. Right? It's not necessarily sending people home, but revisiting that core relationship of peace and diplomacy I think is the starting point in this region. Um, geopolitically, for indigenous people in other regions, um, it's boiling down to education. And I hate to say that because I'm tired as a TA and lecturer educating and TA non-natives all the time. Um, but it does boil down to education and letting people know whose lands they are, they're on and the, the, the real history there. Sometimes we have to be willing to lift the veil of, of some of the myths that, are, that exist in terms of contemporary nation states in North and South America. And it's unsettling. It's really unsettling to talk about decolonization and, and the history of colonialism. But it needs to happen. And we're seeing that happen more and more in North America, I feel. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Any other questions? Any other questions for folks? I have a question. Yes. Someone else does. My, that was a really fantastic talk. Cool. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm pretty new in doing work with First Nations and Métis people, and I wish five years ago when I started this that I had seen this talk first. It would have made things a lot easier. Um, we learned a lot the hard way. And, and the question I have is, um, do you think that the process of decolonization is beneficial beyond First Nation and Métis and Indigenous people? Like, for the, for the broader population, do you think decolonization would be beneficial for all concerned? I, I definitely, I, I personally feel yes, um, because keep in mind that the immigration policies in North America, um, um, or immigration to North America, was the result of some historical circumstances, uh, negative historical circumstances, um, playing out in other parts of the world, right? Um, decolonization, in my opinion, is is basically looking at the core realities of of history and and what came to be and why. Why are we in the situation we're in, basically? 
and asking those hard questions, right? And and you're seeing like, for example, a few efforts like the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Cindy Blackstock, Stock, I think, just had a tweet that said, um, "Reconciliation for young people or for children is very easy to achieve. You just need to give them space, and they'll do it, right?" So basically looking in, and looking at the realities of, of the relationships we have with one another in terms of our relationship on a landscape, our relationship on, on, on in context of history, and, and looking at that critically. And it's challenging because when I speak to Native people about it, it's, it's easy, it's fluid. But when non-Natives begin to hear it, it's sometimes unsettled. Like I said earlier, sometimes there's a fear that we're going to erase ourselves or that uh, we're going to erase who I think I am. Right? But it's not necessarily a racing identity. It's basically lifting the veil of the truth that's there. Right? And that truth that's there in context of this landscape is one that was intentionally planned to be in peace and coexistence with one another. Right? So when we're looking at environmental policy, when we're looking at these community projects, that treaty relationship, or even that indigenous kinship relationship, is super important. It's the foundation of, of successful projects in my mind. And, you know, successful projects in my mind. And looking at the way the world's going in terms of the environment in general, those fundamental human connections need to happen. There has to be some truth telling and truth exposing it, right? And, and, and sitting down and actually coming at it from the core of who we are as human beings. Does that make sense? Cool. One more question. So we're gonna take it over here. Because I know you can talk to Myla at school, so. Yeah. It's not, yeah, thanks. It's not so much a question, but a, an observation, just relaying a reality that I face as a, an elected uh, council member for Pongmaker Cree Nation. And the reality that I've observed the last six months, it's only been six months, I've been only 30 years carving out a livelihood off the res. I've come home. But what I've observed, observed with the team that I work with, is they're so caught up in day-to-day -day administration, putting up little fires, meeting the demands of a very poor people, if you will. The number one, number one problem seems to be a lack of financial resources to pay for this, pay for that, take, take somebody to the hospital pay for the helicopter if they need one, you know, it just, just keeps coming up. So they're so pre-consumed with micromanaging day-to-day -day problems, they don't have time to view things from a, a higher perspective so that they can look at things from a different paradigm. So just, just a, that's just that's a reality. It's, and they don't seem to know how to snap out of it, so to speak. Right, so, just thought I'd share that because uh, it's a, that's a challenge, I think, for most council and, and chief, chief and councils in the country. Yeah. Totally. So, so, just to elaborate on that, um, when I was looking at that, when we were looking at that slide of, of um, four impacts of colonization, Adrian Tanner's work, um, these communities are highly vulnerable. And, and I'm not saying that as, as, as ways of showing you how to exploit them. I'm saying that because as a human being, we have to look at the reality that indigenous people have been through, we have been, we have been through the ringer. And there's reasons why it's challenging to, to, to well, for researchers who's done, who have done community-based research, there's reasons why it's challenging to give you that call back. There's reasons why no one's picking up the phone sometimes, is because we are micromanaging. And, and sometimes it's challenging to step out of that paradigm of, of, of micromanaging for a lot of communities. Um, so when you come in there with these projects and these solutions in terms of water infrastructure or even health or any type of project you want to do, you have to keep that in mind. Is that, that, that it's a very delicate situation you're working in. And, and there's more young people who are critically looking at the work being done. And, and for me, us looking at projects and assessing projects, there's some projects that are highly exploitive of indigenous people. There's some solutions that are being passed that aren't really solutions, they're colonial agendas. And, and, and we're starting to gather strength to be critical of that. Ideally, that's what I like to think. Um, but yeah, there, there is, we are highly, highly vulnerable communities. And we go in there with this notion of wanting to solve these problems, but again, that wide net, that panoramic view is super important because there's a lot going on there. 
if everyone could please join me in thanking well, there's one more question. So um, Milton, I wanted to ask you, you pointed out um, that um, education is a big thing and, and that's what you see and, and that I understand that you're working at the U of S. Um, my, um, and I, I agree with you, education is important and for both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people, especially with the history of Canada. And uh, my experience at the university, because um, I graduated there in 2012, I think, with a land use and environmental studies degree. And um, most of my classes when I was at U of S, I was, I think a lot of times, the only Aboriginal student there. And it was so discouraging because um, some of my classes, um, there was, um, Aboriginal, there was um, there was a lot of um, talks about um, land-related issues that I myself didn't really understand because I didn't grow up being taught that. And um, I guess what I'm trying to say is, oh, here we go. What I'm trying to say, and then those, those are, that, that happened in more than one class that I was. It was a geography class. It was in a native studies class. It was in a um, archaeology. I think it was archaeology. I think they. The instructors at that time, um, like their responsibility was to teach, but a lot of times they didn't t teach the right information, and especially at that level of education, it was discouraging. I did speak up when when I was able to, but only when I understood a topic. But a lot of times there was things that I myself didn't understand. And I guess my question to you is: Do you see? Is there a change? in the university setting in terms of educating people about Aboriginal issues here? Yes, yes and no. So, I, and I hear what you're saying, and, and let, me, let, let's just, let me start by saying that, that education in the university system, and as we know from the residential school system, the concept and the systems of education often were designed to assimilate Indigenous people. Sometimes, when, like, there's a lot of students who I encounter um, as, a, as a professor and as a TA because I don't know what it is. I think it's because when I wear my hat, they think I'm an undergraduate. So they start like talking to me about their professors and the problems they're having. It's a very similar situation here in where the professor doesn't know what they're talking about. They feel where the professor sort of promoting this Canadian agenda, this colonial agenda, and and really um, coming at it from an opp oppressive, paternalistic way. That still happens in university. Right? There's a lot of professors who are attempting to talk about indigenous issues, attempting to talk about the solutions indigenous communities need, and, and they don't have the, the depth or the knowledge or the experience to do that. And I guess I should clarify that what I mean, what I mean by education is, um, I guess I didn't state my education, as I went to school, and uh, I did my undergraduate in Santa Fe, New Mexico, at an indigenous tribal college, Institute of American Indian Arts. So education there, the system was highly different than, than what non-natives promote in terms of education. Does that make sense? So the systems of education, when I, when I say education needs to happen, we see a high number of indigenous teachers coming out of the university right now. The indigenous teachers education program, putting out a high number of, uh, of indigenous teachers. Um, education has to come from the perspective of indigenous people in many ways. So USAS, for example, there's this goal to indigenize curriculum. There's a lot of indigenous scholars and indigenous researchers who have input on, on how to do that. But for the most part, there's still a lot of colonialism playing out in university systems across Canada. Right? There's still a lot of problems in, in university systems that are coming to light that need to be addressed um, in terms of, of the social realities, not only with indigenous people, but people of color, women, and things like that. So it has to be addressed, and when I mean education, I mean indigenous education, indigenous facilitators and teachers, facilitating the development and the knowledge of their students to understand the landscape, understand the political reality and the history. I'm not saying that's not achievable by non-natives, I'm just saying that I've had a higher success rate with my students being a brown face doing that in my classrooms. Does that make sense? Cool. Answer your question? Good? Awesome. Please join me, folks, in thanking Ryan once again for his talk.